Though this morning we want to take a look at the passage that we read from Acts where Paul is in this strange city. And I love going to different places and seeing bridges. I, bridges can be just so beautiful. Um, that top left one, has anybody ever been on that? I think that's down in Madison County, down, down by Winterset. I have not got, I need to go check out those bridges. And there's the Golden Gate and a bridge in rural England, and I think it's a bridge in Italy there. That we need connections to God, and unfortunately, that there's an awful lot in our world that is, in our culture, that is a barrier to God rather than a connector to God. So we, we need bridges, and I, when I look at Paul this morning in Greece, in Athens, Greece, I, I think he's saying that you are a bridge builder, hopefully an even stronger bridge than that, but that's a pretty impressive bridge there. Now, some bridges aren't Legos, but they look like Legos. That's a Lego bridge that you can drive a, a truck across. That, that's in Germany somewhere. I'd love to go see that thing. Uh, Paul asked the question, the psalmist asked the question, why do the nations say, where is their God? People are confused. They're, they're wondering if God is out there, if, if there's a way they can make a connection with this God. And when we come to this passage in Acts 17, we see that Paul, he's come to Athens, Greece. He's out of his element. He is not from Greece. He's from over in eastern Turkey. He did all of his study and graduate study down in Israel. And now he's gone over from Asia to Europe. He's out of his element. And he's waiting for some friends to come into Athens. And he is greatly distressed because he sees that the city is full of idols. He sees people worshiping non-existent things. He, they're, they're worshiping, but there, there's no God behind it. He's according to the scriptures. And so people need bridges, so I encourage you to build bridges everywhere you go. When people came to Spencer, when people started moving in here, there was this river that got in the way of everything. So somebody built that bridge back in 1906. Is, that the, is it called the Thunder Bridge? Or? I got to drive across that this last week. That's quite an exciting experience, driving across that bridge. <laughs> Would you drive a semi-truck across that bridge? No, but we need bridges. Then there's lots of different kinds of bridges, even if they're one-lane, two-by-fours, or whatever, whatever it is there. And we read that Paul reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace. So he, he's, he, he's talking with everybody. He goes to the religion. The religious place. He goes to the synagogue and he talks with people like him, with Jews and God-fearing Greeks. And then he also goes to the marketplace and he talks with people who are there and he talks with all these philosophers, these Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, and they, they find him so interesting. They say, why don't you come up to philosophy headquarters up on the mount, the hilltop, the Areopagus, and we have a bunch of important people for you to talk to there. He just talks with everybody that he possibly can. Anybody who will listen. And they bring him up there, and they ask him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? And there are still lots and lots of people that don't know much about Jesus. We feel like everybody knows about God, but they don't. Or if they heard something, it's been tilted. They've maybe been treated poorly in the church, or they, they had somebody who said things in an odd way so that they, they, they've set it aside and they've walked away from the little experience that they've had. So this morning, I want to talk to you a little bit about a, a pastor and a professor. The pastor is Ken Smith, and the professor, her name is um, Rosaria Champagne Butterfield. Isn't that a beautiful name, Rosaria? She was... She was Professor Rosaria Champagne at this point, and she was a tenured professor at Syracuse University in the departments of English and Women's Studies, and there was a Christian men's conference that came to the city, and she really hated it. So she wrote a letter to the editor saying that this was a terrible thing, this religious men's conference, and she got a letter from Pastor Ken Smith and she read it, 
And she says, it was the kindest letter of opposition I had ever received. It encouraged me to explore the kind of questions that I admire. How did you arrive at your interpretations? How, did you know, how do you know you are right? Do you believe in God? She says, the pastor did not argue. And she was so confused by this letter. I'm actually going to tell you her story over two weeks, this week and next week. So I'll tell you a little bit more about this letter in, a, in another week, next Sunday. But she finally said, I called him. And the pastor recalls that she asked him some confrontational questions. And he said, I asked her, Dr. Champagne, I think that response should be considered in front of our fireplace following one of my wife's good dinners. How does that sound to you? He said, let's not argue. Can we be friends? Can we get to know each other? And you are surrounded by people that need God and that wish they could find a connection with God. And you don't need to argue with them. But most of us do need a little more love in our lives. So Paul built bridges everywhere he could go, and Paul built strong bridges. And we can build strong bridges. I mean, I wouldn't drive a semi across Thunder Bridge, but would, what about this bridge? Grand Avenue? Yeah, you, could, you could drive almost anything across that, couldn't you? Paul, we read that a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. They were saying, what is this babbler trying to say? And then it says he was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. The, he told about the God who made the world and everything in it. He said, God has set a day when he's going to come back, when he will judge the world with justice by this man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. He commands all people everywhere to repent. He, the Bible feels like a big complicated book, and we don't necessarily want to get too tangled up, but what are a couple of simple things that people need to hear about that Paul told them? He told them there's this man, Jesus, and he was raised from the dead, and God made this world, and he made you and me. And God is coming, sending Jesus back to judge the world. If you know that, you, you know everything you need to know to preach a sermon. You don't have to call it a sermon, but you, you can talk to somebody about the fact that God made them and loves them. Jesus came into this world. He's a historical figure. He gave these wonderful teachings, but most importantly, he died and he the Bible says he rose from the grave. That's a miracle. And he's coming back again. And he knows everything that I do, and he knows everything that you do. That's a strong bridge. If you, if you can tell somebody a, a little bit about that, that's a strong bridge. We read from the gospel that Jesus says really powerfully, he says, I'm the light of the world. If you don't got me, you're in the dark. I'm not a supplement to your life. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That is the one light we need. So Ros Rosaria Champagne kept in touch with this pastor and his wife. She was in her 30s. They were in their 70s. Their lives were radically different. But they became friends over the next couple of years, and Rosaria started to read the Bible. And one day she told a transgender friend, what would you say if I told you that I'm beginning to believe that Jesus is real, is a real and risen and loving and judging Lord, and that I am in big trouble? I have met almost, I don't know if I've ever met anybody who has argued into trusting in Jesus. But I've met a lot of people who have told me that somebody loved them. And somebody showed up for them when they needed hope. Or somebody came and spent time with them 
when their life was upside down. And that's what Rosaria got. So tell you next week about her getting up out of, she says, I got up out of the bed of my lesbian lover and showed up in church and God was turning her life upside down and she didn't know what to do with it. But she knew, she was coming to know this, about this Jesus. He's a strong bridge. And we can build welcoming bridges. Paul says, God did this so that people would seek him. He is not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Now when he says this, he, he's actually quoting a very famous philosopher. Not one he grew up with, but one they grew up with. So he's, he's quoting somebody familiar to them when he says, in him we live and move and have our being. And then he says, your own poets have said, he says, well, let me quote you a, a popular song. We are his offspring. He, he's quoting things that make sense to them. He's building welcoming bridges. He's not saying, you know, you really need to read the book of Leviticus. If you did that, you'd... He's, he's, he's telling them words that they already know. And he's saying, these words point you to God. We can build welcoming bridges. That's on the Sundial Bridge in Redding, California. Beautiful walking bridge. I'd love to, to go visit that. Rosaria Champagne says that I, before she went to this first dinner with the pastor and his wife, she says, I wanted to get to know these people, but not at the expense of compromising my moral standards. Even though obviously these Christians and I were very different, they talked with me in a way that did not make me feel erased. She says the most memorable part of the meal was Ken's prayer before we ate. I had never heard anyone pray to God as if God cared, as if God listened, as if God answered. It was not a pretentious prayer uttered for the unbeliever at the table to overhear. We did not debate worldview with that meal. We talked about our personal truth and what made us tick. Ken and Floyd did not identify with me. They listened to me and identified with Christ. They did not share the gospel with me at that meal. They did not invite me to church. When the evening ended, Pastor Ken said he wanted to stay in touch. All he did was love her that first meal. Heard pastors say that people will not care how much you know until they know how much you care. People won't know how much you know until they know how much you care. Do you actually love the person in front of you? She says, if Ken and Floyd had invited me to church at that first meal, I would have careened like a skateboard on a cliff. So build welcoming bridges, be authentic, show actual love. And then what happens? Well, I, I call this build or find, find your bridge. I don't know if that's actually a good title for it. It might be more like God is going to turn you into a bridge and it's going to hurt when people walk on you. Paul says, well, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. God changed their lives, everything about their lives. Jesus said, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. Jesus tells, says that everybody should become his disciple. He says, you are the light of the world. He wants to make you into a bridge for other people. So when Rosaria Champagne became a Christian, she says, I did not know how to bridge the two groups of my life, my new Christian friends and my gay and lesbian friends. Sharing this, a friend reminded me that bridges get walked on, and that is a normal part of being a bridge. Then I relaxed, remembering that this is God's work, not mine. 
bridges do, do get walked on. And if the Lord calls us to be a bridge, we have to learn to bear in his strength the weight. And it hurts, and it's good. And the Lord equips, as he promises in Scripture, he gives us the strength that we need to stand steadfast and trust in him. Then she says, I did not perceive conversion to Christ to be a blessing. It felt like a train wreck. That was surprising for me to read that. She said, I was writing a book against Christianity that I no longer believed in. I was scheduled in a few months to give the incoming address to thousands of Syracuse University's graduate students. What in the world would I say to them now? The lecture that I had written and planned to deliver was on queer theory, and I threw it in the trash. I was flooded with doubt about my new life in Christ. And she gave the lecture, and she says, I returned to my office drenched with panic sweat. And an angry student leader came in to rebuke her because of this horrible, slightly God-oriented lecture that she gave. She says, I accepted my resignation from the student group that he chaired, and later that week, from five other student groups. She said, I had to accept it. I was a failure. She felt like Jesus coming into her life had just destroyed her career and made her a failure. She says, the story of my conversion ran like wildfire through the university community. But God wants to make you and me into bridges. She says, instead of having fewer students, I had classes that were over-enrolled with students sitting on the floor and in the aisles. Her classes got flooded with students who wanted to hear, what is... What is something real that is going on in this woman's life that would so radically alter it? She says, some came for the carnival aspect, but others came because God had put them where he wanted them. As a lesbian, I had always been an outsider, but now I was a different kind of outsider. And in my new status, God brought me a new group of hurting people. She's like Paul. And you are going to meet people this week that don't know about God, don't know know, what is going to happen after this life. And you may or may not have the opportunity to talk out loud about it this week, but pray pray for them, and God will open open a door for you to point people to Jesus, to be to be his lighthouse. It's a great privilege. Amen.